Okay. Let's see who we've got here. Okay. I think uh, Nana's trying to get in. Oh, no. Uh, Bridget, are you online? If you can hear me. One second. I think I'll get sure. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. We're starting. Great. We're in the same. <laughs> Two weeks. So. Exactly. Okay, so good morning, everyone. I think we can go ahead and start. Can everyone hear us clearly? It's five by five. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. So, uh, anyone who's not speaking, if we can just keep mics muted to minimize the feedback. Morning, Victor. Morning. Um, and yeah, paradise. Eh? Which one? There. Cover. Mine. Okay, I think we can go ahead and start. It's 8.05. Thanks everyone for joining. Yeah, so, so I think I think I, I will start, Natalie. I just put my cam to people to see me. Uh, if you don't mind, I will start now and then hopefully people will be joining. So first, um, uh, I would like to introduce myself for the one who don't know me. Uh, I am Chris, uh, Jean-Christophe saint Esteban, the DRC country director for Uganda. And uh, I wanted to make a few words before uh, uh, the colleagues uh, start the presentation. As first, of course, I would like to thank the Royal Danish Embassy and the Nuri coordination function to support this uh, full two-week training on resilience design for water management and there's the Northern Uganda Resilience Initiative, NURI. Uh, I would like, as well, of course, to thank all the related ministries of the government of Uganda and all the districts which have been so supporting about this initiative. Many greetings to all the stakeholders attending the two-day virtual open house on planting the rain at Etego village, as we call it, uh, among ourselves. At last but not least, I would like to personally thank Warren Brush as the lead facilitator on this training, and as well as Natalie Topa, the DRC Regional Resilience and Livelihood Coordinator. Um, let me now uh, introduce uh, Martin Malinga, who is the DRC Nuri project manager, which will give you a very short brief about Nuri. Then we will have Natalie and Warren making you a presentation. Then we will be able to have a Q&A session. Uh, thanks again for joining uh, us today. Thank you very much. Over to you, Martin. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, called Martin Malinga. I work as project manager for Nuri. Uh, I'm based in Arua. I'm going to give you uh, a short background about the Nuri project. Nuri in full is the Northern Uganda Resilience Initiative. It is a four-year project funded by Danida. It runs from 2019 up to December 2022. It is a, a continuation from the previous project, which was called Recovery and Development for Northern Uganda Component, which had the DAR implemented in West Nile and then run at in actually subregion. Nuri has the three outputs, climate smart agriculture, rural infrastructure, and water resources management. DRC is implementing rural infrastructure and water resource management outputs, but the third output, that is water resources management, were implementing together with the Ministry of Water and Environment. Uh, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Water and Environment is in charge of generating plans 
and the DRC implements identified infrastructure projects. In terms of geographical coverage, Nure is implemented in 13 districts in the West Nile and Acholi subregion, and also five refugee settlements. The objective of Nuri is enhancing resilience and equitable economic development in northern Uganda, including refugees and host communities. The project activities include construction of community access roads, establishment of food forests, market improvement, construction of water ponds and dams, and protection of springs. The approach we're using for implementing Nori project is labor intensive approach, whereby we work with the community groups who are paid through cash. Uh, now we are focusing more on integrated systems using resilience design approach, which Natalie and Warren are going to take you through. Uh, for now, let me stop here. Thank you and wish you good deliberation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Go ahead, Natalie and Wally. Thank you, guys. Great. Thank you so much, Christoph and uh, Martin, and also thank you to Rila and Victor. Um, and remind me your name? Roscovia. Thank you for uh, joining from African Women Rising. So we're here today in the Kampala office of DRC, and we've just come back from a hefty uh, training in the field, which was uh, what I call, I don't call it a workshop, I call it a work hard shop. Um, my name is Natalie Topa. I'm the Regional Resilience and Livelihoods Coordinator for East Africa and Great Lakes Region uh, for Danish Refugee Council. And um, you know, I think that uh, this approach that I've been trying to bring about bringing, you know, permaculture, system-based thinking, and nature-based solutions to addressing the root causes, um, often of of the the realities of displacement-affected communities here in East Africa, where we're working. So I've been working with Warren Brush for um, years now, and really trying to bring into DRC. Uh, a new way of thinking about the challenges that we face. So, you know, here in East Africa and around the world, we talk about this daunting issue of climate change. And uh, it's a very big issue that we often just are, feel it at a loss <laughs> as to how can we address some of these issues. Um, so in our approach, we tend to focus more on what we do have control over, and that is ecological degradation. Uh, understanding the, the natural systems and cycles in which we live um, and that we rely on. And how can we work uh, with the tools and resources that we have to heal those cycles so that communities can be more resilient and buffered from climate and weather extremes and shocks and stresses. Um, as well as, uh, uh, you know, from all different types of shocks and stresses that occur when ecologies do start to collapse. So, you know, when ecologies do collapse, they often take uh, livelihoods, um, economy, security, stability with them. So uh, I think this approach through this presentation, what we want to highlight is the importance of, of kind of, it's almost a return, although it may seem innovative, it's, a, it's really a return to being more intact with the landscapes that, that feed us, that nurture us, and that provide the basis for our livelihoods, our economies. Um, and so what we've done here is create something that I call, I'm calling it a sponge village. And, uh, and we're going to take you through this presentation on the journey that we've been in for the last few weeks and also how we're applying this to Nuri. Um, and this is something that within DRC and East Africa we're taking throughout the region. So we have programs in Burundi and Tanzania uh, and increasingly in, in many other countries and as well as globally. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Warren. <laughs> I want to introduce Warren Brush, uh, who, with whom we've been doing the training to start our presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chris and Martin, and especially Natalie for your vision for this. And everybody here in the room and everybody who's joining us uh, on the on the presentation uh, virtually. And I'm excited to be able to share a little bit more about our journey, not just with this program specifically over the last two weeks, but also with the the other trainings that we've been doing uh, over the last uh, year and a half to support Nuri and to support the teams here in Uganda with the Danish Refugee Council and talk a little bit about 
how those programs have worked out, what the demonstration sites are now looking like, um, and then we'll go deeply into what we did over these last two weeks, which almost feels like a lifetime. So um, I'm really uh, excited to be here and uh, appreciate your uh, uh, your time as well. And so we'll jump right into this. And uh, I, I, if it was my choice, I would have called this presentation Planting the Rain because this is uh, so much of what Natalie talks about is uh, so much of what hold on we've got some feedback go ahead Uh, we cannot hear you. It seems you are mute, maybe. Warren. Sorry, apparently there is a small technical issue. Sorry. We cannot hear you. Uh, seems that it's a Bridget laptop you are using and it's mute. Okay, just one second. Okay, We're having a small little it's, technical it's working, issue. It's working. It's working now. We can hear uh, you. You're mute. Okay. Great. And now can you hear me okay? Yeah. You go, okay, okay, five by five, oh. go ahead. All right, so I, I would call this presentation Planting the Rain, and the reason I would do that is that so, so many of the villages that we work in, so many of the communities that we work in um, around the globe talk about the, one of the most limiting factors for growth in their agro ecosystems is water. And yet water isn't the problem when it's times of flood. We, we see that a lot of um, communities experience these incredible floods. They have plenty of rain, but the landscape is no longer set in a way to receive that rain in a way that can turn it into life itself and production in an agro ecosystem. So part of our work is to get that rain rather than to be erosive, to carry away the nutrients, to cause damage in the landscape, is to convert that into a life-giving force, which is is, is something that water is destined to do in a landscape that's not been degraded. And conversely, during times of drought, we would be, we, we see times where there's no water available. There's no water stored in the soils because the soils have been degraded heavily. There's no more, you know, very few trees in the systems that embody a lot of water. And so during times of drought, we also don't have access to good growth. So our work in planting the rain is to mitigate floods and also mitigate drought to create growth that can occur year round. On that point, I was thinking the other day, it's funny that we go from, from water scarcity to drought scarcity. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's really true. And so um, here in this slide, like Natalie said, we we have a you know, we can't control in our programs the overall climate crises that's going on right now. We can't say we're going to change these big long term cycles that are changing and shifting and affecting us. But what we can do is we can buffer that um, those shocks and stresses by restoring landscapes. So much of the climate climate crisis is directly uh, is directly caused by the landscape degradation, but also it can be mitigated by landscape restoration. And so, in this time of a perfect storm of climate and landscapes falling apart, it's time for our programs to start to get to the root of resilience which to me is really around having beneficial relationships within our sustaining ecologies, our societies, and our market systems so that we're supporting our landscapes to be able to have healthy 
not just the ecology, but the ecology allows us to have healthy systems of economy. Any word on that? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, if you look at, um, you know, it, here in East Africa, just instances of conflict and instability and issues around peace and security and the things that are the drivers of displacement, um, oftentimes it's, it can be so often tied back to the landscape that can no longer support communities and, and meet the needs of people. And so I think that as an agency and as an industry, we really need to sort of hit the refresh button uh, on our understanding of these systems level uh, ideas that are contributors um, and drivers of both conflict and displacement. Um, so, you know, I think also, you know, here in East Africa where livelihoods are so by and large driven by uh, you know, the relationship to the land, whether that's cultivating food or uh, maintaining livestock, these systems are going to become more and more stressed. And the good news is that there are actual things that can be done to reverse some of these cycles. That's great. And I, I, I like to think of Nuri. Nuri is the Northern Uganda Resilience Initiative. And here that word resilience is the binding word in this. And so looking at what that what does it take to create that programmatically on the ground? And a lot of our work in in developing resilience on the ground has come through uh, this idea of building a foundation that is wrapped in geology, it's wrapped in hydrology and biology and the place where those interconnect. So this idea of in geology, it's like what can we do to shape the landscape to be able to plant the rain to slow the erosion what are those generative structures and implementation strategies that we can use to help give a boost to living systems i see a lot of programs go out there and say yeah we're going to do a, a tree planting program but they they don't account for the the degradation in the landscape and you put a young vulnerable seedling into the ground without structuring it for its success and you see that that seedling oftentimes will die away and so you have a lot of tree planting programs that actually fail because of the lack of understanding of how to work with the geology when we had trees covering the landscape the the trees actually gave function to the slowing spreading and sinking of water in the ground and and so without the trees that are here now we have to restructure or terraform that landscape in a unique way based on the context of that landscape to give boost to the biology and so when you see um when you see that earthworks giving uh a potential for slowing and getting that water in the ground and getting good infiltration and banking water in the soils and in those interstitial spaces of the soil you start to see the hydrological cycle start to being able to uh, support the biology in the system and so you get this uh, savings of the water in the landscape for times beyond the flooding time of year, the rainy time of year into the dry season. And what that does is that it protects us from drought, it mitigates the flooding itself. So the very same geological structures and implementations that we do um, to harvest water are the same ones that protect against flooding. And that also creates microclimates that allow for healthier growth of the biology. And so at the core of the biological process, is is what I call the soil microbiology or the soil food web, which is this incredible uh, eco ecological system it's that a it, it's a universe <laughs> within the soils that helps to maintain plant health. It, it helps plants to be more nutritious. It helps plants to resist de disease and also pest um, by the assistance that they give in translating nutrients and so many other functions within the ground. In fact, it's the soil biology that actually helps to hold the water in the soils during for use in the dry season. And basically that stabilizes the, the biology itself stabilizes those structures we do on the landscape in the mm -hmm. geological area. So if we build a road or if we build a bioswale or if we build a dam, it's the biology that makes that a long term regenerative structure. It's like the infrastructure of the infrastructure. Yeah. You know, also, Warren, what I, I pe people often don't realize that in a in a fully functional, thriving forest, 
when you have a big rainfall, up to 90% of that rain is held in that forest. It just infiltrates down and through the trees into that spongy forest floor, and it doesn't move. It doesn't just start, you know, collect and, and start to cause erosion and accumulate into floodwaters. So when we, and in the areas where we're working, so, believe it or not, so many of these areas actually were very thriving old growth intact forests that were holding the water. Now, when we remove that forest and the whole system starts to collapse, uh, that's when we start to get this melting away of the soil with erosion and this accumulation of floodwaters into huge disastrous events. And so when you look at this, this uh, uh, coming together of the geology, the hydrology and the biology, and at that, that intersection in the middle is where resilience to me is the, uh, it, it's the place where resilience hits the ground and Nuri is right at that place in the work that we've been doing over these last months. And I'm, I'm very excited about how we can look at this as the foundation for all these other, other aspects of programming, whether that's infrastructure, whether it's markets, whether it's the um, uh, the the uh, building of, of refugee camps all nest on top of this foundation. And so that's what we're trying to present here today is how we're doing this in a practical way. And the work that we do at DRC, all of it is in an ecosystem <laughs> or a watershed. Yeah. And so um, quite a few years ago, um, I think it's been about eight years ago now, we have had um, uh, through USAID, we have been bringing together uh, different uh, different types of regenerative practices that exist in the world right now. So things like permaculture, agroecology, agroforestry, food forestry, the soil food web, which I mentioned earlier, holistic grazing management, rainwater harvesting are all movements around regenerative practices. And we've brought them together into what we call resilience design and how and in being able to take these different principles in the these different movements and bring them into the operating space of the humanitarian and development world and resilience design was born from that so when you hear us talking about resilience design it's talking about permaculture agroecology agroforestry but in a way in an that allows it to be accessible for the unique operating environments that happen in the humanitarian development world. Mm -hmm. And in within USAID, we developed this, uh, both the permagarden model and the resilience design for smallholder small holder farming systems, uh, which I was one of the co-founders of or uh, co-developers of with a wonderful team that I work with, including uh, Tom Cole, who's one of the founders of, uh, of um, African Women Rising, who we have a representative here today. And, um, and so this has been something that has been brought in as a guiding principle, but I wanna say that DRC, the Danish Refugee Council, has really taken it to another step. And I want to acknowledge that because they're bringing it into the agency. Yeah, woo -woo. Um, it's like we're in this little conversation here. It's, um, but it's it's been very interesting for me because I am really wanting to put my energy into an agency who's willing to take it agency wide. And so seeing the traction at headquarters, seeing the traction with programs around the country, around the world asking for resilience design to come in and, and Natalie to bring it to them um, because of her unique ability to do that in the programmatic setting has also brought us to investing more in in um, DRC's uh, uh, practical application of it within their programming environment. So even on this last training, there's a partnership with SCALE, which is a US, uh, USAID award that is, is partnering with DRC to help take this to the next step. And so I want to acknowledge and thank DRC for being a global leader in this. And also, I think I want to just mention, you know, we have Danita here in the room yeah, with us. Yeah. Um, the importance of donors to have a bit of a risk appetite and go to the next level. So 
you know, just having the bravery and the courage to say, yeah. wow, this, we're not really sure what this is, but it sounds good. We think <laughs> this is going in the right direction and we really want to, we want to go on this journey with you. So it's really important for our donor partners uh, and the Danish embassy as well, we are, yeah. uh, which is represented here. So donors also, you know, I can see, I, I do see trends moving in towards really trying to find real solutions to the problems that we are having yeah. year after year after year. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, so the application of resilience design, we work from the permagarden scale, which is basically the household. You can apply the same principles from there to the whole farm or the community level, uh, and, you know, up through the, the like individual shamba or the, the small farm that supports a family to the whole community level, which is where we are now with Nuri as we're working at this community level and moving it into the watershed level. So this course that we just taught was working at a sub catchment level of a larger watershed and uh, and so the the principles stay the same they just apply in unique ways based on the context of the site so that question always comes up is how scalable is it well it's really scalable with the will and with the resources to be able to take it out and there is a lot of work we're doing at USAID around cascading as well so um, looking at how do you cascade this so that the technical efficiency or technical proficiency that is uh, being shared during a training will cascade out into the subsequent training after after right. uh, the initial program and I always I, I always laugh a bit when people ask about the scalability because it's literally to the scale of our living planet because that's <laughs> that's really what we're doing here is trying to work with nature not against nature and heal these natural cycles that we've disrupted through our human activity why don't you talk about this okay so you know um, when I when I joined DRC, I, I really made it clear that for me, resilience is not just in the livelihood sector and about income generating activities. It's really a, a method of systems based thinking. And in the case of our agency at Danish Refugee Council, you know, we work with displacement affected populations, including refugees, IDPs, host community members. Um, and I think that this approach of resilience design and permaculture is applicable uh, you know, ac across the board when we start to have more inter interdisciplinary and integrated ways of thinking. So, you know, some of the interventions we might have, whether that's in a camp or a settlement, can have implications on gender, natural resources, definitely public health and water and sanitation, agriculture and food security, um, the infrastructure that we do, how we apply design thinking to shelters, to camps, how we lay them out, how things are oriented. Um, or and marketplaces, yeah. Yeah, for example, yeah. We're, you know, we're uh, doing some market, uh, physical marketplace structures and trying to integrate more circular bioeconomy, um, but even the protection risks, nutrition. And so the, the more that we, integrate our programming the stronger it is the more points of juncture that we have the more resilient that our clients are our clients being the beneficiaries so the more that we can leverage our energies in the different sectors that we're doing the 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 more we can optimize and have multiplier effects to really increase absorptive adaptive and transformative uh, resilience and so here yeah. we're going to be looking at the rural context in a village um but it's it doesn't you know it's mm -hmm. the design is applicable in any context where we work yeah, yeah great and you'll we'll show you some practical uh examples of that as we go through the presentation and take you out to the field here shortly so which i want to start i want to um just back up to july of 2019 which was not our first drc training this this last one uh, that we just did over these last two weeks was our seventh that we've done together. But um, as far as having an influence on Nuri, it began in July of 2019 when several of the lead uh, project managers and engineers with the Nuri program came to a training in Ajumani, Uganda. And it was a training that we did in July of 2019 that was based basically teaching the principles of resilience design at the household level and the small farm level. And so I want to show the homestead, level. the homestead level. Yeah. yeah. And so here is um, just a brief showing of the interventions that we did over these two weeks uh, back in July, where this uh, landscape had formerly been uh, an erosion, a place where heavy erosion was that she, the woman whose site this was, uh, was 
uh, having just limited yields like her yields on her production were not that great because the water was passing through and whenever water passes through your landscape it also takes away your nutrients so often what i'll do is if i'm if if we have water going i'll take uh like a uganda shilling and i'll i'll take it out and i'll i'll put it in the water and watch it flow downstream because the literally that's what you're doing when you let water flow off your land and um, and you basically in the in the rainy season you let it flow off without infiltrating and saturating it first before that before then moving on you lo you're losing your potential for growth so here we change that story through uh, several different interventions if you look within here you can see there's bioswales with trellising systems there's interstitial tree planting so giving perennial and perennial stability to her annual system so you can see between uh the the trellis systems there's the area where she can plant her annual crops but then up top you have this amazing tree planting system with good protection for those trees to get them up and going and a lot of biodiversity in this system and i'll show you the next uh just bit oh yeah please so you know when Warren talks about perennial stability what that means is that what we need in our landscapes and our farms are permanent things things that we don't harvest and then you know at no point should a farm be harvested and just be barren and dry and dead through the dry season it should be an evergreen place and those perennial or permanent plants trees and shrubs become the infrastructure and the life support system for the annual crops that's great so this is the same site now um this was taken about uh, i think two growing seasons later no, one. one this was one growing season later so here you can see the picture on the left hand side of your screen is the trellis system over the bioswell so not only are we stacking functions here where the the trellis provides shade for the water we harvested so long into the dry season she'll be able to grow another crop and that's one of the things that i really yeah. like to to um to share with people is that you can grow dry season crops if you're banking your water and you're protecting against the thieves of rain which is the sun the wind and slope and i just want to point out that those baskets on the lower picture that you see popping out are those same same baskets that you saw earlier in the food forest so as those perennial yeah. trees start to grow exactly like it's those ones there those baskets so as those perennial trees are growing, you still have all kinds of time and space to fill in the meantime as you're waiting. Oftentimes you see people doing plantations or woodlots with one monocrop and are totally ignoring the huge layers of opportunity for income and food and nutrition in the meantime. And if you look on the left hand picture, you'll see her maize crop is there as well. And she also has beans growing as an understory. And so that's another thing that we promote with our cropping systems, which is having companion plantings that actually increase the amount of nutrition that you can produce per square meter than if you do a monocrop. And reduce the need for pest, uh, pesticides and fertilizers. Or eliminate it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So then we did the next training, which was right before all this crazy COVID uh, time that we've been in, which, uh, you know, most countries it started in March um, or we we had our lockdowns in March. And so we squeezed that in just before that in February of 2020, we did a roads for resilient agro ecosystems and basically a training where our agro ecosystems could also help our roads be more sustainable and and have less maintenance cost and so that was also a two-week training that we did uh we did this time in nebi in northwestern uganda and one of the program areas of the nuri program and we had uh how many engineers in that program and people from where well we had 50 participants in the mm -hmm. training and of those we had 10 district engineers uh, because we are trying to you know bridge the capacity not only only to our our in-house DRC staff, which are civil engineers and infrastructure and shelter uh, professionals, but also to the uh, to the district officials and the local government, so that this is knowledge that can be expanded and built upon and remain in the districts where we're working. Yeah. So so we arrived on the site, and I'm going to get into it a little bit more. But the um, the 
basically we ask the team there, where is their trouble on the roads? Where is their difficulty in the roads? Because when we do a demonstration, what we don't want to do is go to the site that everything's working well. Um, what we want to do is we want to show that we can heal a landscape or restore a landscape and make it even better. And so as demonstrators, um, I think anybody in any type of program, when you do a demonstration part, uh, uh, site, you go to the least common denominator in who would replicate that. And so we went to a place where they said this road floods every every rainy season and it was a Nuri road that had been built uh, previously and it was in a place that they had to cross a low point in a valley where they couldn't actually go around on contour and avoid that place because of land issues. So it wasn't their fault, but it was an issue none, nonetheless that the road was impassable most of the rainy season. So we took that as a great opportunity and you'll find one of the principles in resilience design is the problem is the solution. So you look at the problem and say, well, how can we turn this into a solution? So that's what we did. We turned the flooding into food and livestock ponds and potential for um, uh, agro ecosystem development. And so we started to pull the water that was flooding the road out into the agro ecosystems that were along those roadways to be able to boost the agriculture um, production along the road. So often roads get designed in a way where the engineers go two meters off of the road and they are they're done with the water. When they take when they're having to drain a road, they go two meters off and then they're no longer responsible. And what happens is you get a lot of flooding along the road or you don't look for ways that that water could actually help the community. And oftentimes it actually causes damage in the community. Well, and not only that, it continues to tumble down the road, collect mm -hmm. and accumulate yeah. and cause larger floods down the road, which is why we say by diverting that, we turn it from destruction into production, make use of that water and eliminate the risk. Yeah, and so in both working with equipment and with cash for work program programming within the community, so the community was understanding what we were doing. And right this last trip, we went and we talked to one of the cotton growers. Yeah. And will you share that? Yeah, so uh, I mean, it was just one of the cotton growers along one of these that we put. In fact, it may be this one that we the, the this picture. So there was one main corridor that we were addressing. It's a dirt road where animals travel, collect a lot of nutrient, and road also travels down. And what we did is we worked with our teams that were doing the hand dug work, uh, diverting that water off of the roads and into on contour swales into farms. And when we went there two weeks ago, um, just as part of our training and site visit, uh, there was one cotton farmer who had all of the cotton that was growing directly along the swale um, and you know near the swale was literally twice as high as all the little shorties <laughs> that were in the cotton field and so it was just a surprise even to our team and the farmer noted that yes there's no doubt that the production and not only the size of the plant but the quality of the cotton heads uh, was much much bigger yeah and and also just doing long-term uh hydrological banking of water in their farm area and okay. so one of the next steps with this programming is to teach them how to protect it then from lose it losing it in the dry season to sun and wind especially whenever we do these swales i think of it as like opening up throats in the landscape and Just, allowing yeah. the allowing the land and the soil to drink and drink and drink and deeply hydrate all of that water and store it for long-term hydration and then we took a lot of the heavy roadside water that had moved that was moving down the road that was causing direct flooding in this one particular side and we rerouted that water using uh, geological inter interventions with uh, various drains bioswells uh, silt infiltration pits into a livestock pond and potential aquaculture system. And so this is us digging that system. So I was appreciative of uh, Danita and Nuri for being able to say, hey, let's look at how some core interventions with higher cost uh, equipment could actually change the hydrology in that area or stabilize the hydrology in that area where you spend a little bit more using the heavy equipment but you can get a lot more done in a, just a few days so this is basically um, 
you know, four to five days. And and there's you can see there's a drain coming off the road up in the upper right hand side. Um, you can see there's a borehole. If you look just to the left of the excavator and up uh, to to the top of the picture, there's a big tree right there. And if you look between that tree and the other big tree, um, just beyond the dam wall, there's a borehole. And so one of the other cascading effects of this is that we are um, also recharging the groundwater for boreholes. So I meet so many different people that um, are drilling boreholes. Their programs are during drilling boreholes. And my first question to them is always, what's your recharge plan? What is the plan that you have to recharge the water that you're drawing out? And they usually give me a funny look and they just say, huh? You know, like, what does that mean? Well, the system is a cycle. And so that, that cycle doesn't break down. Um, I've seen many areas where boreholes dry up and um, and and this is something that we can stop that by being smart with how we rebuild hydro hydrology. And in our industry, there's this, you know, that's always the default is to go into the groundwater rather than capturing, you know, primary and secondary water resources. And we actually are contributing to the disruption of hydrological cycles. If we're not putting more water into the ground, then we are taking out. So for DRC, I always say, we need to demonstrate how do we have an ecological recharge plan. So here, this is now just a couple a week and a half ago. This is us going out to the site and looking. Here's a picture on the left is the road. There's a road drain and into a bioswale. Um, there is uh, back flooding bioswales. Uh, this is the pond, uh, the dam that you saw in that first slide. Uh, talking about the dams now completely filled and the particular way we design this is what we call a back flood bioswale. So we actually capture a lot of water throughout the system and it all maintains one level because the clay was good throughout the system. Now one of the things I was pointing out to some of the Nuri team is that if you integrate aqua or fish systems into this, one of the ways you can um, determine the amount of fish that you can put into a system like this is based on the, the amount of shoreline that's planted. So if you have a meter of shoreline, you can put one tilapia in there and other species as well per meter of shoreline. So what we've done by creating a bad flood bioswell is we've increased the stocking capacity of this entire system if in the future they want to do an aquaculture well, system. Well actually in this particular pond the community the government is doing part of their wealth creation program oh, they are good. going to be stocking with fish. And this was no longer here this water you see all this massive amounts of water here all would have been on the road had this not been designed. This was the water that was causing the flooding on the road that no longer made it passable during the rainy season. It was impassable. Season. We just picked up the flood and set it into a yeah. pond. <laughs> and then interestingly, right below the dam, the, the woman who owns land right there planted her rice this year. And one of the things she said is that this is the best rice yield she's ever had in her entire time and years growing rice in that exact same spot. And it's this whole idea is once you slow down the water it's more accessible to biology and you get a biological uplift yeah you get a biological uplift and what it'll happen is is it's not going to get worse there year after year it's going to get better mm -hmm. season after season because now that that system's going to be recharging and developing further um, nutrient resources as well as having long-term water storages um, then we talked about the borehole. If you look here, you can see some of the pictures here with the bioswell berm. The dam wall is just above, just upslope from this, uh, this uh, borehole. And the borehole, they're saying, is pumping water. It's closer to the surface than they've ever seen it. And um, I guarantee you over the long term, and this would be great um, monitoring and evaluation points, is to look at the water uh, levels within that over over a long period of time to see how that's uh, how that's playing out as far as water security as well. Yep. Yeah. So a lot of the people who took the course originally in January or pardon me January February of this last year um, we did a second uh, spring recharge which uh, was at another site called um, Omir, School. Omir School and we did just some 
brief interventions to we had very little time, but we still got in a good bioswell and some tree plantings. And this is what it looked like behind that bioswell, um, this particular trip. So it was holding water. And one of the things they said is that just that amount of water right there was lessening pressure on the um, like being able to um, wash, uh, you know, do wash being able to make mud bricks there's a whole lot of different things that this water could be used for even though this isn't the best drinking water because it has manure in it and stuff it's good for a lot of other material domestic usages and domestic uses but what happened is is that the oops sorry um i'm going to get you to the crazy slide next um but what happened is the spring here is already starting to um develop better than it was before we started. And so it's starting to have cleaner water and a little bit more flow according to the local people. And that's now translated into the other newer engineers and some of the projects they're doing. Oh, there's a helicopter going overhead here. So just give me a moment. Everybody, there's a lot of excitement around the presentation. <laughs> yeah, there, people are arriving in helicopters. <laughs> okay, so. Um, I'm noticing it hasn't clicked over yet. It takes a minute, doesn't it? Yeah, but it may be. Yeah, yeah. So what I want to do is walk you through now one of the amazing projects that w have been done by students of the first course um, and first two courses that we've done. And this is a particular spring called Bapa Spring in the, I believe, the Torrego district of Uganda. And this is one of the Nuri projects where there was a, uh, a spring line that was um, basically the runoff on the road was combining with this water where basically it was undrinkable because you, you would get cholera with it because of all the manures and things combining with it. It was completely unprotected and very, very little flow very tiny flow and the women at that point were having to do what to get their water now well so at this this was just a, a spring eye coming out of the spring line and as warren mentioned all this erosion was coming into it so it was really poor quality water um this is only one of two sources of water in this community either this tiny little trickle but when that uh, is not available people have to go down to the river women have to go down to the river and and dig down into the sand and and that place has such low water animals go their livestock they're all manuring in it they have to take that manure filled water take it in their jerry cans and come home and wait till it settles and then drink it and they said they had so many worms and the gastrointestinal issues mm -hmm. um and should i talk about the timings now nope no, nope. okay. we're gonna get to that so basically what was done here and i love this here here's the road coming in on the left and i'm going to walk you through in a in a circle here you have this or i'm going to walk you from upslope which is you'll see on the left hand bottom side upslope road they, um, the team engineered a drain that came off a 2% drain, basically taking the silt, uh, the water, the nutrient off the road, and they brought it down to on the right hand bottom here. I'm going to go counterclockwise around here, an on contour bioswell. And then that bioswell on contour slowed the water down. And so when water can't go this way or that way, what it does is it infiltrates. So right above where the spring box is, which you can see is in the middle of the system, it's starting to sink millions of liters of water that formally caused damage on that on that spring and erosion downhill from here. And so there that bioswell, when it flooded and, and reached its capacity would spill over into a gentle drain that went down to a dam and all along that area to the west side of that dam area is about to be planted in a, what we call a food forest or a multi-species forest planting system which will also give sun protection to that water because we don't want that water to evaporate um, we want it to stay there long into the dry season for the, for the livestock and other domestic uses and then there was a natural system System drainage that went out from there back into the you can see the greenery which is um, behind that natural drainage and so that would take it back into its natural drainage so once the system filled to capacity it was it, it literally could then be protected from the flooding by the very same structures mm -hmm. Also down from the pickup area off the road, we they also used smile berms in a net pattern 
to harvest water and to get tree systems up. So that was right above the spring box. And then they built a spring box as well. So here's the upper bioswell. Here's the tree systems with uh, smile berms. See, it ha hasn't clicked over yet, has it? Well, it may be the- just It's the going slow, okay. Other people have received it. Yeah, hopefully you've received the new, the next piece. And then basically there's the, the dam as well and the bio the uh, tree system smile berms so nuri also did a spring protection box um and i i actually of all the spring protection boxes it's one of my favorite i've seen them all over the world just the way they designed it so um, i want to give applaud the way they designed it and it made it very accessible for people to get down and being able to get back up and in and out of there with heavy loads. Um, but there's a lot of benefits that you wouldn't necessarily think of with this. It's not just about this presentation. We talked about the intersection of different sectors. And I don't know if you want to talk about this. Yeah, well, so first of all, one thing I, uh, uh, I, we went in the very beginning of our two week trip, but then I went back again the following weekend to capture some more of the images and also do some measurements and testing. And what we found is that before this intervention was done, that tiny little trickle of water that was coming out of that spring eye, a woman took 27 minutes to fill up a 20 liter jerry can with that tiny little flow. But now because of the intervention and all that water soaking and soaking and then biologically being filtered, it's coming out in this constant, you know, from an urban area, you're like, ah, turn off the tap. It's, you know, you want to stop it. Um, but it's just a, a flow that comes down and now it takes one minute and 50 seconds. So imagine if a woman is spending th three, having to go for three or five uh, different trips, you know, that reduces her time poverty. So for five jerry cans in a day from two hours and 25 minutes to only 10 minutes of just the filling. Uh, so also it's a protection issue for us because as we know, we have major protection issues as men predate on women as they're fetching water and so uh, this is also uh, can help to alleviate that risk as we have a secure place with a constant and reliable water flow. Uh, the water flow is completely non-stop so uh, you know it's not only for the drinking but for hygiene in the household for all the domestic uses. Um, and, and that water flow goes right down to the dam so when it's right. not being utilized there it's going through a banana system, yeah. pawpaw system, uh, napier grass, so food for livestock, and then it and then it ends up in the dam. So it's also one of the things we look at is efficiencies with overflow water. And often in spring boxes and boreholes, you have the water overflow is actually causing the malaria. Yeah. The wastewater is actually causing malaria because it's creating the right conditions for mosquito um, honeymoons. Honeymoons, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so there's all this multiplier effect. Not only do we have you know more volumes of much cleaner quality water, uh, but the whole area is going to start to regreen. And so even the grazing of animals becomes more viable around mm -hmm. there. And then you have all of the wastewater from the flood as well as from the from the spring itself are actively filling up a dam. Are you showing photos of the dam? Um, I did just a minute ago. Okay. Yeah. And then this is another example of that same type of system in another location. This is a Rebo spring. And so I'll just, I'm not going to go through it again, but again, it's the, it's a application of the principles um, based on the uniqueness of the site. Every site has unique context specific issues or opportunities and constraints. So I want to again, give uh, kudos to the team or, or applaud the team uh, the for Nuri the Nuri engineers yeah. for being able to take what they've been learning in these programmings at these these resilience design programs adding their own experiences to it and combining that to do some good designs so here we are now we finally got to this place and we have i think 20 minutes and we're at the end of our hour of our presentation so we're going to wrap this whole program by talking about what we just did and this where the first program was at the household and the greater farm level training Maybe just before you go back a quick question mm -hmm. because i visited that site where you had this uh, spring recharge exactly the dam there, there is a spring eye, which is actually yielding more water than even there. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what your advice would be because if the communities realize that the spring eye at the dam is yielding more water than the one in the box, chances are that they will go and have a spring. 
Well, so you're saying that the water, the system is catching so much water that a new eye is coming up near the dam? Yeah, when we, we went up to yeah. the dam, we, yeah. we were spilling more from yeah. the spring eye, which is in the dam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think in the coastal excavation, they came up yeah. with us. Yeah. I mean, so that just means it's good news on water. And so, you know, uh, I mean, what we're doing is establishing a system that can be self regenerating. Every time it rains, it's harvesting more and more water. And so, you know, those are just both two new sources of water. And, and the other thing that uh, a lot of these systems will do, and like we'll talk about with the Otago uh, Sponge Village project, is that at the bottom of the system over time, because water will move very slowly within the soil itself down slope. And so on average, water will move about six meters a year underground. So over time, what we find is that uh, spring lines will be recharged that are even away from what we're doing or within the system. Mm -hmm. So um, you'll start to see higher water flows throughout and oftentimes what we'll do is we'll then place a borehole just down from that to tap into that, uh, that perennial water. Mm -hmm. And so that becomes a way to do it. Um, the other thing is the system, um, what I would say is with that particular issue is, yeah, there might be more water coming into that system. I would say do an aquaculture system. System because if you have good flows going in there, then that means you're going to have good water quality for a good aquaculture system. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is that the um, over time, the upper eye will also produce more because the the again that six meters a year of water moving when it hits that and gets into that spring line even more so you're going to have more water flow in the upper eye as well. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one way of answering. And then the the course we did this last two weeks in Atego. Um, which just is ending, uh, had ended last uh, Friday, um, we were looking at how to break the flood and drought cycles through a well-managed manage, uh, water management intervention, soil building and bi biodiverse plantings. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about this work hard shop that we did. <laughs> um, whenever somebody finishes these courses with us, we, we say you didn't pass the course, you survived the course. <laughs> because you it's a such a of survival. yeah you get a certificate of survival because it is a lot of work we're out there 10 12 hours a day many days um, working together so you're learning uh, you're getting muscle memory you're learning in your muscles not just your brain and it's a different kind of training than sitting in a classroom even though there is a classroom portion of it so we begin the first two and a half days by teaching theory so going into the theory so that there's a background that we um that we're doing that uh helps the 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 nuri team or the participants that are with us to get into the field and understand how to interact with the community with this but also how what do you look for what are you looking for here what is the process of harvesting rainwater well there's principles you follow and so you learn those principles first and then we go out and say this is how it applies in a practical situation on this site and then we were also um, because the other training was in nebi we were very fortunate to be able to go to that site first to learn from what we did last time and so the more demonstration sites you have the better you're able to actually capture learning and evolve what you're doing and to make what you do each time more and more efficient more productive and then we start this process of community engagement and and this uh, is something that is uh, often uh, is, it's a little different the way we approach it because we go into the community and we say what is the story here what was this place like in the time of your grandparents what is this place like when you know before it is now you know and and when you look around there's trees that are just completely been you know have gone and we talk to the elders and we have them come stand in the circle and tell some of the story of what it was like when they were little kids or their grandparents time and they tell the story at this particular village of how this was just treed 15 years ago i think yeah and and how when the trees were there they had food for their animals they never didn't have good clean water they always had clean water that's one of the gifts of trees trees help us to have a good healthy hydrological system so much of our work is actually mimicking the function of trees and so when you take out those trees you start to have a 
collapse of all the biological systems that maintain health, that maintain the food and production, that give actually a good quality of and life. And medicine. And medicine. That was one thing that they said is we used to have so many indigenous trees in the landscape and, and medicinal plants, and we could always just go and access them, and we were always very healthy. We had all of those foods just and available all, all the time. And through active listening, through seeing their expertise, we acknowledge them as having expertise in the field. We begin to start to demonstrate. And here in the bottom right hand picture, we're actually doing a small scale, what we call sponge demonstration, which is showing some of the types of interventions on one square meter that we would be doing to be able to store the water. Because what, what we did is many farms. Yeah, too many farms because we asked them, we said, well, what do you want? Part of the story of place was what's happening now. You know, it's part of me. What happened in the past and what happens now and what do you want for the future? And what they said is we want it to be like when we had trees here. We want trees again and tree planting programs have failed there. So that's very interesting because the landscapes in a um, in a degrading uh, a pattern that doesn't support young new lives too harsh so we have to recreate the conditions to do that and so we're showing them we can help you with your goal what are the things you want like livestock ponds trees all these things that would help them so here we're demonstrating what happens when you um you pour water on a system that you've done interventions in versus one that you don't and what happens is the water just flows away with all the nutrients. So we're showing a farm that's cleaned and swept or tilled, uh, has yeah. a major loss of soil and water runoff. But if you design it to store and capture the water, the one on it really qu stayed quite put. It's a very effective uh, small demo and then we ask them which one would you want they always want the one with the interventions we say well then we can help you with what you want we're constantly bringing it back because we want because this is our project because this is their project it's their life, it's their life. and so that's something um i think is, is really important and we yeah. work side by side with them and that's something they're not used to seeing uh, you know, all of us in our DRC jackets, going in our, our vest, going out there and actually sweating and getting blisters and working together. And, and sunburns. And <laughs> sunburns, especially for us fair-skinned people, we get so sunburned. Um, and then we share meals together, which is a, a whole different way of interaction and engagement. And so Natalie did this wonderful, uh, wonderful drawing here. And, and, you know, we first arrived there to look at the site and they said, we want a dam here for livestock, which was low in the system. And it was basically looking and saying, you know, it's in a heavy eroded area and there was no clay there. And it was in a place that wasn't so accessible to the community. It was down low. So my battery's going low. So I need to, uh, I need to be plugged in somehow. Ah, uh, that's it. I think we got it. And even the district engineers were like, oh, we're going to come and build valley tanks in this training. Yeah. <laughs> Down deep in the valley. And so when we went in there, the first thing we did, and when in, in uh, Resilience Designs, we look uphill. What's happening up from us? And we could see in that system, we could see that there was charcoal pits, stumps of trees, the whole place was denuded. And when you don't have trees on your hilltops, immediately that tells you that the hydrological system is broken. We saw and, opportunity as well, a little Yes, crawl. yeah, yeah, we saw corral there. Um, but we, we asked them, well, where they wanted the dam, um, what does the water flow like during the rainy season? And they said, and they were standing, and it was about almost two meters deep. And we said, and what's the quality of the water? Oh, heavy brown, heavy brown, you know? So it was very, very thick with the erosion of the mountain above them. And so this place would be very difficult to actually build a large dam that wouldn't just fill up in one or two seasons with silt. It would just be um, a, pretty much a useless waste of money for Nuri to invest in it going there. And so we had to walk with the community to go out and say, OK, let's um, let's look at where we could find places higher up in the landscape that have better clay sources that actually if we store water up there, that's cleaner. And then that water has head pressure or has gravity to be able to feed it throughout 
off the whole system. Here you can see there was all the erosion places. So we went up to the very top and we saw all these opportunities to be able to fill large dams above the village. <laughs> Hey, one, just hey everyone, uh, thanks for sticking with us. We just have a little glitch here with uh, our technology, so just one second, stand by. Thank We're you. We're almost done. I think people can, can anyone hear me? Yes, Natalie, that's you. Just give us just a minute. We're trying to get our systems back up. And then we'll run, we'll, we'll wrap every, you know, we have the, just the rest of the slides, which are very exciting. So don't leave us. <laughs> don't walk away from this excitement. Or we'll have to come to your home. To you. No worries. Okay. Is it charging now too? Yeah. Okay, good. Ah, it was the plug. Okay. We're resilient. <laughs> <laughs> We're just reopening the computer. The plug wasn't working, so we've got it set up now. And feel free to put questions in the chat. See people sitting just across <laughs> from you. Is it still recording? Recording from here. It's recording here. Okay. So let's see if this comes back on. All right. Am, but see, am I on the? I don't think that we're in the. Okay. Okay, yeah, bear with us for just out there now. You know how to do it. Yes. Almost coming. <laughs> do we know? All right. Just a second. You should see the just presentation up. Should... There we go. There we go. There we go. Okay, you're back. Uh, so we're just going to get our video back on and our presentation. And is our video on too? Yeah, there we go. And then full screen. And then, yeah, we'll do full screen, which is there. And then we just need it up there. You've got it. You know why we don't see it on the screen? On the TV? We are trying to connect to the TV. It's connecting. But the people can see your presentation. Yeah, they can. Just one second, yeah, everyone, everyone with us. Well, we'll just have to, because Victor doesn't have a computer to see. So I want to make sure it's. So he just did that. So we'll disconnect and then yeah, try again. Okay, so try again with that. Almost there. Okay, we're, okay, we're almost, almost there. there. Yeah. yeah, you can hear here. Almost here. We can hear here. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's amazing. Yeah, maybe maybe we don't get this here. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, if you connect, oh, there it is. There it is. And then you do the no you, signal is detected. You why you, don't you okay. put the HDMI? Yeah, can you, it, 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 why you don't do the HDMI? It, it, it wasn't connecting. We tried that. Well, this is a different computer, though. It, uh, is there an HDMI in the side? We can just do that, too. Here, let, hand me the HDMI. It's a trick. Is there one? Yeah, there's one. Sorry, guys. Eh? Yeah, I think there's something wrong with the cord. Well, uh, we'll see. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah, well, it didn't work on my Mac. It, it wasn't able to work. And it always works whenever we do this here. So maybe we should just go ahead keep. And... Yeah, keep going without the. Yeah. So can people like... can people see the people can see the presentation? Yeah, see, it's yeah, not we working. Like can yeah, maximize? we need to go full screen. Not here. Here. Mm. Here. Yeah, if not, yeah. you can see it. Then I think everyone can see. So let's maximize. OK, sorry about that. The thing is, we've got some people here uh, in the conference room with us that we're not able to get the picture up on the screen, but we're just going to go ahead and continue. So thanks, everyone, for your patience. And um, oh, this is the one. Yeah. yeah. OK, great. I think that's OK. Well, um, just I think it's OK. Just, 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 just OK. Yeah. OK. Yeah. All right. OK, so. Thank you. So basically here we we ended up um, looking at all the different opportunities that were available to us high up in the landscape. And so we started by just really calculating what those catchments were. So we used Google Earth and we um, basically calculated that there were um, in the larger watershed that we could harvest from and this isn't even the main watershed this is just sub catchment of the larger watershed there were over 64 million um, you know uh, liters of water potential for harvesting that's just runoff and even in one storm we could get five five to six million liters of water so we knew we had enough water to actually fill multiple <laughs> interventions so we did an overall design um, that basically started high up with a high dam uh, in the landscape. This, this drawing is not to scale. I just want to <laughs> the valley dam in the top is massive. It's absolutely massive. Yeah, yeah, it's the largest of the ones we did, but it was high up in the landscape, so we had a lot less uh, potential for silting that that structure being silted in, and and a lot of vegetation that could that could uh, filter that. And we'll go through the whole design as as. Uh, we basically make our way down the valley through everything from uh, uh, dams to drains, bioswales, food forest plantings and multi-species tree system plantings, um, a large agriculture system that's being fed by road water runoff and um, being able to uh, uh, also do some mitigation in the uh, the canyon itself where the runoff was occurring. So we started with the top of the system um, with the uh, the top dam. And so I'm going to take you there. Uh, and basically this uh, this system was located for several reasons. One is that it's it's location elevation wise, but also it had really good clay content. So this became the driver of all of our dams that we had enough clay there to uh, bring into other areas that had less uh, uh, or, or not quite enough clay. And so this, this particular dam, um, the capacity is about 
4,868 cubic meters of water, which is, you know, over oh, close to 5 million liters of water storage at capacity. And this is water that would have been in previous times during a flood just washed down and caused erosion and taken nutrient with it. So again, we always have to consider the nutrient cascading as well as just the water itself. All right, so um, here you can see an, uh, a view from a, uh, a, a drone where you can see we did a spillway for the dam that is separate from the dam wall. So to make it very safe is an important thing that um, is important to us. So we have ways of expanding out the catchment of the dam as well so we can pick up more water and that's part of what that did. You can see where the spillway is is also a pickup point that brings water into that dam. and. Uh, and then the water from there overflows into the main valley where we did gully plugging and one rock check dams. So then we start to work down slope, walk you through this. We did a drain uh, from the upper valley, um, which uh, gave us an opportunity to take water we call run on water. So it's water that would have flowed into the, the main gully uh, causing erosion, but instead high up in the landscape, we're diverting that water at a very gentle drainage. So all along there you can plant and you can have um, tree systems there that can be supported by this drain because it's not too steep. And we basically then we reduce the erosion downstream, but we bring this water into a high capacity growing system nearer to the village. Um, we have uh, then our upper bioswales, which um, are systems that are not on a drain of 2%, but they're completely on contour at the same elevation, which are tree planting systems. And this being the uppermost bioswale is uh, basically, it is larger than the others to be able to also use as a silt harvesting area. And a lot of our systems, the silt harvesting is a, um, uh, an important potential for another uh, income for being able to use that sand for um, uh, for construction and and it's other also usage. used by women for plastering their homes. Yep, yep. It can also it's very nutrient rich. Also, it can be taken to gardens. Yep, yep. So there's a lot of multiple benefits there. Um, and then as we start to make our way down in between the bioswales and in other areas feeding into this overall catchment, we're doing these tree planting systems. Here you can see these smile berms because or half moons because they look like smiles and they're oriented to the uh, upslope area so water and nutrient will go into them and notice the pattern set here the pattern itself doesn't allow water to gain velocity as it's moving through this area and to start to cause erosion and to carry nutrients away because one will spill into the next spill into the next all the way through and then we protect those systems with um, uh, tree protectors um, also some of the Nuri projects were doing fencing around larger plantings. And then the berm itself, uh, the ditch that's there, we fill with multiple nutrients. So the idea of feeding the trees over the long term and starting to boost the soil biology. And, and coupled with that, we do a process called FMNR, which is Farmer Managed Natural Regeneration. So here is a woman, I think this was Victoria, and she called this Victoria tree. So each person who's doing this type of pruning, we name that tree after them. And one of the reasons of doing that is that there's also some um, there's also some uh, um, protection that comes by actually having a name for the tree. One of the things I see globally is when people are harvesting wood for coal for making charcoal for cooking they do it where they cut the main growing stem of the tree itself they they literally cut that and they they bring it below grazing height and then what ends up happening is the goats and the cattle and everything will eat it so that it never gets above grazing height again and the the wood growth is is limited so what we do is we teach how to help it grow and and gain 
um, more height and canopy above the grazing. And this is this process that we taught there. And so here it all starts to come together. And we have a middle dam, which is right near the village. You can see in the lower right hand corner, uh, the village in the background. So this is a, uh, 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 a process of, of building a dam safely um, and I'm not going to get into that right now but this is what it looked like at the end when we pulled the uh, the topsoil back up and over to grow stability on that dam. That dam having things growing on it, having grasses, having bamboos, things that have uh, netting root systems will actually make that dam strong for generations. The structures we're building will last generations if associated with biology. This middle dam has over 3,729 cubic meters of water storage right at the community. So this is a whole other uh, benefit for them is now they don't have to walk downhill to get the water at the place they originally showed us. They And then walk uphill with heavy water. So that's a, a calorie usage that takes place for carrying heavy things uphill. Now they can get their water from this for domestic use and walk downhill with that water or move it with carts uh, downhill. And then we did a third dam, which is a hand dug dam. I also wanted this to show this is such an amazing dam. Yeah. And uh, this one uh, was much smaller, but also it is uh, very affordable to be able to do. And this was a 282 cubic meters of water storage and the community and Nuri worked together to build this. And then at the lowest point in the system, we have an overflow system and you can see it's armored with stone. So this is the place that all of those dam or these the last two dams and all the bioswells this is the exit point from the system where we bring it back into the valley but now it's had the energy the kinetic energy pulled out of it so it's less erosive we have less uh, damage happening to communities below us and we have more water now moving down slope underground at six meters a year rather than it moving at six meters every couple of seconds so just to be really clear um you know we have the top dam but then as soon as we have the drains and the interconnected swales all the the, low, the two lower dams are completely interconnected they're catching water and when as soon as one fills up it spills into the next into the next and finally it goes back out onto the original course that the water was taking yeah and so here we're also using road water runoff for agriculture systems so this is a regenerative agriculture plot that's 20 meters by 15 meters and I wanted to talk for a second about that because the reason that we did this garden is when we heard from the community about all the loss of their you know, food systems and things like that, uh, we just decided to make an organic indigenous garden so that they have a long-term seed bank and long-term seed security so that their, you know, their traditional indigenous crops and greens and things like that will always uh, can be grown here and they have a, a long-term source for seeds. And it's organic, there's no use of chemicals or fertilizers or anything like that. Yeah, and also the, um, the nutrients from that corral are now being utilized for production. And so here we're, we're, this is now the terraforming that we did, the plantings that we're doing, it was like some of the first ones we described with the trellising over it. We made footbridges for good access whole system to be able to um, be able to be a long-term growing system for the community. And here we're mulching again, do, providing protection for the system. Um, and then also fencing it, another form of protection. So this system being a biointensive system can grow much more food per square meter than people's, people's uh, monocrops that they've been using and, and doing. Um, I'm just kind of moving through this quick because we had the glitch in the middle of it and we also started late. Um, and so then we did erosion mitigation in the valley itself and really ultimately bringing this together in what we call a sponge village that will break those flood and drought cycles and empower both the landscape and the people to be resilient. So I don't think you can empower people alone to be resilient unless their landscape is resilient. Conversely, if you have erosion in a community, you will also have cultural erosion. Mm -hmm. Both things happen. So we have to work with landscapes and people as one. And the idea of a sponge village should be not for just 
here in places in Uganda, but also where I live in California, we're doing our home and our community as a sponge as well. So this is universal. Mm -hmm. And with that, I think uh, what we do is we went about seven minutes over what we had started. Uh, so uh, sorry about that, but we still do have some time for for some questions, I believe, too. So yeah, and I just want to end by saying, you know, we talk about resilience, and I know that that's the new buzzword of of, <laughs> of our industry. Um, but you know, when you think about a program like this, it is it does apply systems based thinking to a, a space, a landscape, a community. You know, there's so many multiplier effects of resilience. So we're built, building the resilience of households to food insecurity to poverty, the resilience of roads to erosion, uh, the resilience of, pe of people to not being able to access uh, markets because the roads are impassable, the resilience of soil to erosion, the resilience of, you know, animals to dehydration. And so there's so many, this whole universe of mm -hmm. resilience uh, that you could measure in there. And by the way, we did do a small baseline during this as well with the households that live in the village. So we want to monitor when you have a water available constantly constantly yeah. to your animals. What does that mean for your milk production? What does that mean for the, the body condition of your animals, even during the drought, you know, the dry season? So we really want to look at um, how, you know, what are the multiple layers, the time poverty of women who are not going to have to be, you know, walking through, um, uh, you know, t to risky areas through uh, to get getting their water. And for far, they use. have a long way to exactly. go. Exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah. Anyway, thanks everyone yeah, for joining in our you. presentation. We've got about 30 minutes left and we can open up for discussion and questions. So thanks for bearing with us and being resilient. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's great. Um, so yeah, we've got uh, Rila and, uh, and Victor here as well as all of our people on and, and online. And uh, and Proskovia. And, Scovia, yeah. And Chris. John Christoph. So great. So Is there any question I've seen. Okay, so let's get the chat and we can mainly about the resources required. Oh, great. Um, so yeah, so from Leela, this is amazing how much work, um, what do systems require regarding maintenance during the years? So it depends. Um, it depends on what it exactly it is that you're talking about, but especially with the larger earthworks where we have really, really degraded landscapes, one of the key things that people have to remember is the desilting and maintenance and the, uh, you know, of those systems. But but the so this, this is something that I think is really important to look at because the more biology that is involved from the start, the less silting they'll be. So what happens yeah. is, as the system commissions, there'll be less and less silting. So for example, the program that we did back in February, it was right in the middle of the dry season. We could not plant. And so when the rainy season came, um, there was some silting that came into that system that had it been timed in a way where we had been able to grow uh, napier grasses, vetiver grasses, uh, bamboo, we would have had a much better filtration system that would have lessened the initial impact to that. So the depends often has to relate to how quickly you can get the biological support system up and running. And so if you have to wait until the beginning of a, of a rainy yeah. season to get it planted, then you might get some silting in the beginning. But over time, it should stabilize where the uh, the like the maintenance of it would be so minimal, if any. What we're trying to do is get the landscape to just yeah. into an autopilot. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know what I say about Nuri is that Nuri is not an infrastructure project. It's an it's an ecological project. It's a, a biodiversity and you know landscape health project. Hydrological. With a, <laughs> hydrological with a, with the infrastructure habits. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so anyway, it depends. You know, if it, if you're talking about um, a, a farm versus a watershed, and for us at DRC, I really do want us to be moving into the watershed level I don't know if Maria is on here but you know we can really start to impact the root causes of displacement when we are looking at the larger scales there was another question from Harriet similar to the above question what kinds of resources are you looking at to this to reach the scale I think um, you know this training was between 40 and 50 thousand I think or something like that and that we had USD, two yeah. USD we had two X excavators, we had two bulldozers, we had two dump trucks, we had 165 people, 
uh, for two weeks. And, you know, to be honest, I think, you know, you can sink a borehole in a, in a, a deep well, and that can cost between twenty and $30,000, depending on what you're talking about and with the location and the bedrock that you have to get through. So it's really relative, but, the but, kind of impact. Yeah, but you look at Bapa Springs, the one we were talking about. Yeah, so in that example, um, you know, I think here in Uganda, it can be, uh, eight thousand, you know, between seven and ten thousand dollars to sink a borehole, and I think that one was. Up that to was the, a spring. That was a spring, right? To do a, you know, a borehole. But when you talk about a borehole, you're talking about spare parts and hand pumps breaking and water management committees that have always struggles, oftentimes with lack of accountability. But when we're getting the landscape into autopilot, I think that one was not more than twelve thousand dollars. It took five days, and this again is a system where uh, the every season where, with every rain, it's just going to be refilling and refilling, and then that water biologically filters. So to answer your question, Harriet, you know, it really depends on. Uh, the scale that we're talking about, are we talking about a camp, a watershed, a farm? So like in Dadaab, you know, those will be smaller systems. Um, but I will say that this process is low tech and it's mm -hmm. process based. We only use locally available materials. We're not coming in with some technology that people can't replicate or some system that's so complex. Um, and by the way, I will say that on that note, you know, I think the reason that some of this works and people get excited about it is because there's something nostalgic about it because <laughs> what we're doing is we're respecting ancient innovation mm -hmm. and we're respecting, you know, we're not, we're not really, we're kind of re returning back to the way that uh, people were doing things for a very long time because they had a, a billion, billion, thousands of years yeah. of laboratory testing. And 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 also doing using appropriate technology. Yes. Like a lot yeah. of times, the um, the technology that can cause so much degradation can be the same technology that can heal and and can restore. And so here it is: we're using bulldozers, excavators. We're using people with you know, pongas and and uh, um, and and jimbes, and we're we're hose. restoring and ho yeah hose. <laughs> we're restoring landscapes um, with the same tools that have also cut down landscapes. And so I, I think it's a really uh, a good look at how we use technology tool or a weapon and I like what we're doing with Nuri is that we're looking at all these resources that are available to us in this modern day and structuring the landscape in a way that it has the stability of an ancient forest mm -hmm. which is the you know that has had 3.8 billion years of evolution and 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 basically laboratory time in evolving itself to be highly efficient and so we're looking to design for that high level of efficiency and and like Natalie said, the local resources make it just a whole different level of replication that's possible as well. So mm -hmm. if you um, if you're bringing in like the large equipment are for large hydrological interve in interventions that stabilize the hydrology of that area, but then the smaller interventions that are all done locally can be replicated within that structural stability. And in fact, as we were doing the training, um, there were two households that just, they went home and they started and applying right away. So, yeah. um, um, and then there was a question about: Do you have technical specific <laughs> yeah. specifications and design manuals? So, I will say two things. One, um, th this approach is so highly context specific. You know, you will you'll never see anywhere on the planet that has all of the traits that a Tego village has. And so, what this process is about is not how to do this thing. It's how to approach and how to think about spaces and landscapes, identify the opportunities, understand and how to read the landscape so that you can apply a design that will work for that place. But I will also say that um, uh, we're working with USAID. This is actually going to be an exciting joint, um, a joint initiative with uh, Danita and USAID and uh, DRC and Mercy Corps is to develop a field guide based on this. So we want to have a product uh, that will be a written or printed um, product that is going to really go through the details of what we did here and how this thinking can be applied to other contexts. But I will say that, you know, the challenges um, and this links to your second point, Albert, is about government, because obviously when we're talking about doing large public works, people want to know specifications, BOQs, and so the interesting nuance here is that we are working with local government and so we they're starting to understand okay these are the kinds of things we have to budget for recognizing that you have to ground truth and do all your site assessment on the site but then your second part of your question about institutionalizing um 
uh, and about working with the government in Uganda, you know, one discussion we've been having is how do we increase the governance aspect of this of this project and how do we work? You know, we know every government, every district government uh, annually has a budgeting cycle and a planning cycle. And Harriet, I think, and Nicoletta, you know, even for our projects in Dadaab and, and places, um, you know, working with local government and having shared learning dialogues around the times, identifying the calendar, these windows of opportunity as per their calendar on planning and budgeting, and how can we, um, you know, find, just have shared learning dialogues and help to influence and help them to understand if they want to develop, adopt a pilot project in their districts, how can we help them to budget? What would that take? What would it require? Because Nuri's not going to be here forever. We're going to pull out and we want to make sure that at the district district level people can expand on this and build on what we've done and and also uh, the participants in the program we've right. been doing you know yeah and then also another thing we're talking about is you know how do we now Sorry. move up and link uh, to the national level with some learning events like um having larger scale learning events at the national level uh bringing in uh, uh you know delegations who may be coming through from the donor side as well as from you know the line ministries and having a having a a session like this where it's a learning session we discuss we present uh, we did have a media team with us as well and we will um, hope to be developing a series of different videos uh, to share out really what we've done here um, so thanks for that you mentioned about the uh, the Nuri video that was done um, yeah at actually, the last training maybe we could throw the link in there yeah let me do that I'll put a link in that so in the last training um, which is really exciting if you think about it. You know, we are building roads all over East Africa and all you see are these miter drains that end up in this, it's not even a dead end. It's a, it's it's an erosion beginning point. Um, and so just uh, how we work with road water harvesting, get that water from destruction on the road to production in the field. And so we did do that video. I'll share that. Uh, and it's just five minutes, but five it's very minute informational. Video. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I can also share a link to the Burundi video uh, that True. we've done because we've uh, we've done a similar approach. I mean, working with uh, resilience design in Burundi and our resilience clean project. Um, so I can share that. Um, so and if people want to make comments, you know, we can. We've still got until 10, 10 a.m. We have twenty two minutes left. I don't know if anybody wants to make a comment on this side. Uh, yeah, maybe I can say, can they hear me? Yeah, yeah, come yeah. on over. Uh, that during our implementation monitoring uh, committee visits uh, uh, a couple of months ago, whenever it was, uh, in the Nuri program, we visited some of the food forests that have also been done, which is mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of the tree planting with a, a mix of different uh, varieties of trees. And, and we came up with this, uh, we, you know, the, the, the Nuri engineers are very good in repeating some of these catchy yeah. phrases that, you know, that really uh, make people think about things like the, with the water that you slow, spread, yeah. sink. And then we saw this uh, food forest where already after, you know, it was already, it was in the first season, a little spring was starting to come out mm -hmm. of the, in the middle of this, uh, the planted area, oh, wow. just from the, I mean, the trees hadn't even really started growing yet, but just from the, you know, the, the water, water, capture, the water yeah. capture. Yeah. So yeah. we said, okay, you can add another S and you can say you slow, spread, sink, and then a spring comes up. Yeah. <laughs> slow, <laughs> spread, <laughs> sink, save, <laughs> spring. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's yeah, great. that's great. And also, we forgot to mention that um, we uh, at the end of this, every, every time we do these trainings, we do an open house at the local level. So we invite uh, local government, donors, I think from the Danita and embassy side, we had about 13 participants out of 40. Um, so it's a really good learning opportunity. And I would say that, you know, Mark uh, Wambui, who um, was our our content creator, uh, you know, he, we were thinking about having him speak, but because of time we weren't able to. Um, but just the importance of the storytelling mm -hmm. and capturing, because, you know, we're out there doing what I think is really, I mean, groundbreaking work, no pun intended, but um, <laughs> Yeah. No, I mean, and the other th thing I mentioned about Nuri is if anyone knows what the, what the word Nur means in Arabic is light. 
right? And so I love the name Nuri because it's like we're shining a light like for the world on what uh, what this whole new approach can be done to build real resilience at the at the systemic level. Um, and the more you more you harvest water, the more it reflects the light. Right. <laughs> uh, no, but it's just the importance of uh, you know making sure that we are um, capturing the data qualitatively, quantitatively, yeah. and yeah. being able to tell the story and get this out there. Because for me, you know, I've been in East Africa for 15 years, uh, and every year it's the same story: drought, flood, food, water, energy, and security. Come on, I mean, it's I have fatigue of the. the so for me, just going towards the solutions, we know we know how to repair these cycles and heal them. Uh, so yeah, just the importance of. I mean, I'm doing these silly little drawings, <laughs> just trying whatever I can. Impressive drawings. Yeah. <laughs> so illustrative for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so yes, uh, the presentation will be shared. How would we? Yeah, we we will. We'll, we're recording it. We're, well, we're recording the presentation, but also the PDF of the of the PowerPoint. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, so food security, incomes, markets, access, natural resources, regeneration is the way to go. Yes, um, <laughs> much thanks. So thanks, um, thanks so much, uh, Wilfred. Um, that's you know, for me, we're resolving so many issues when we design the landscape like this. We're resolving the issues of drought, of flood of food and nutrition security um, and also species recovery. I mean, that's something I really want to talk about that's important is, you know, the importance of ensuring that the, the, the not just the agrobiodiversity, but the biodiversity, because we humans suffer from plant blindness. We only see plants whose value we understand and everything else gets ignored. You know, Victor was sharing that when he was a when he was a young boy, and would go hunting there were wild trees right victor and you know those were things that you knew those fruits and you would go and access them and anymore it's very hard to find those trees so even species recovery species security you know and in our food forests uh we really want to work to um to be getting you know ensuring that we are you know protecting protecting that genetic resource of the of this yeah. landscape I, I also want to I also want to bring up that um, you know this isn't a one-off. We don't go for just two weeks. Uh, Nuri has already been working with the community. Mm -hmm. um, the road that came in that we did the road water harvesting is was a Nuri road. Um, the uh, the follow up to this also has been included in structurally within Nuri to be able to have time to be able to do additional plantings in the system to follow up to do monitoring and evaluation. And so I, I think it's really important. Like I, I believe Nuri is going to be doing up to 1800 or between like 16 and 1800 projects similar to this uh, in their scope and um, that <laughs> yeah but the um, the the importance of the long term follow up you know over the first 6 months after the system is there ideally through multiple systems is really important and so i just wanted to also acknowledge that that's a part of this it's not a one off and i i don't think that a successful program could happen in that way you don't just come in and just say i'm here and then i'm gone mm -hmm. um, because if people don't understand how to harvest wood from the trees that are planted in a sustainable way it's just going to lead back to the same place they were in before Right. And so that's really important. So Proscovia from African Women Rising wanted to make a comment. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. It's mine is just um, so uh, I'm so inspired by the presentation. Uh, I'm very happy to participate in this because um, what we are talking about here, planting the rain, uh, doing all those regenerative structures and everything. I'm just very happy that uh, the presentation has gone in the line that we are also looking yeah, at. Yeah. Uh, and also to confirm what uh, you have just mentioned is that this is not a one-off activity. Yeah. It's a process mm -hmm. that uh, we have also been doing it as African Women Rising for quite a number of years. Yes, you but have. We, still, we are still in the process and every time uh, the resilient designing mm -hmm. has its different uh, approaches, mm -hmm. you get from here, the next time you see another landscape because you see each landscape has its own uh, styles yeah. and it, all of them speak different language, meaning <laughs> like it is it is going to teach you each and every time new skills yeah. as to come when you get into a landscape that is speaking about uh, uh, coming from the right, you need to speak a language that talks about the right. Another one is telling you that I am coming from the left, so I am just very uh, happy yeah, and yeah. 
Thank you know, you. it's, Thank it's you really an inspiring you, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would agree that there's no finish line, yeah. you know, with this process. It's um, we, we have the whole earth that we have to heal and repair. Thanks, Mr. Yeah. 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 John Christoph. And uh, this is Chris, uh, the RC country director. But first, thanks very much. I mean, uh, as usual, with Warren and Natalie, very enthusiastic presentation who passionate everybody and again this time it's also a successful training and i want to thank also the danish embassy again and the coordination function for being in the field with them in the mud to look a little bit at these things for me also something which really uh, essential is that it's a, a really a community-based uh, resilience programming and that is essential and i really appreciate the fact that Warren and Natalie were asking the people what was there before, yes. what people were living before, because they were living definitely much better than now in certain aspects. So I think that this um, new way of working, and you can imagine organizing such a training with all this machinery, all these people involving also those are people working on Nuri plus the district. It's a very challenging, very demanding. And uh, as they say, uh, they are survivors uh, from this two weeks training. <laughs> it's not just attending. I think you have to Even survive it. You, you just have to survive it. So I, I am very optimistic that we will uh, be able to, um, to expand uh, with the support of the embassy. But I hope also that other donors will bring on come on board to support this way of working because we have seen that it, it's working. And we have a long-term support with the Danish embassy, and I hope that we can expand that and also look at other countries. But definitely, it's the way to go if we want to have this planet becoming better. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, yeah. Chris. Good. Thank you, Chris. Victor, did you want to share anything? Yeah, maybe just to really thank you for for the training and for the the presentation, the debriefing. I remember that I uh, actually got converted. <laughs> when you made the, the debriefing on the training you carried out in Germany, yeah. mm. and that is, uh, and I also tried to convert Rila <laughs> after that. <laughs> I was <laughs> I was convinced, and I tried to encourage uh, that we needed really you to come uh, mm. back and, and, and help us with the training. Um, I think your approach is is really good, and I I really encourage you to continue with this approach. Mm. Yeah, because. Uh, it is effective. Yeah. The reason why we had the first training on the rural infrastructure, resilience design for rural infrastructure, and also the resilience design for water landscape is because you convinced us. Mm. Yeah. Right. And you convinced us not just you know by let me say by mouth, but you convinced us by the your approach, but also the result that we are, we are beginning to see. So thank you very much. For ah, that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Victor. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Victor is the representative from the Royal Danish Embassy today, and Rila here is a part of the coordination function from Nuri, which okay. is working hand by hand with the RC. Yes, thank Royal you. Danish Embassy. Thanks so much, um, Victor and Rila, both for your comments. Um, I think, let me just see what the... I also, just while you're looking, I wanted to just acknowledge African Women Rising and uh, Scovia uh, just spoke uh, before Chris, um, that they are uh, pioneers in the permagarden process. So developing these principles on the small scale and doing it with women's groups all over Northern Uganda. And I, I just really appreciate the work that they've done has been a, a formative part of us developing the resilience design approach. Great. I think this was a comment. Uh, one of our challenges as a ministry, as a this is from Albert Orijabo. Um, one of our challenges as a ministry of water is to link watershed restoration efforts with livelihoods options. Another challenge is the piecemeal approach to restoration through focusing on selected hotspot areas, um, which often affects upstream downstream interactions. The Ministry of Gender is promoting labor based infrastructure development to partially address uh, the livelihoods, this has been exciting. I mean, I think this goes also back to the slide that we had about the integration of sectors, you know. Is this a pro is this a road project that we did in the village? Forestry project, mm. an agriculture project? You mentioned about the young 22-year-old man. 
too. Oh yeah. Saw. So you know, um, in the in the first training when we did the dam in Nebi, and it has already filled up and uh, is is being used for agriculture. Um, but there was, uh, I think, Bridget told me. Bridget is here. She's our communications intern, and she was speaking with people um, around the dam just to get some feedback from the community. And Bridget, you said there was a young man who was about 22 years old, and he yeah. was a yeah. poor young man, and he his dream was to build a house, but um, getting the water to make the mud bricks it was very expensive because if you take that from a borehole, you have to pay permission so uh, but now suddenly there's a dam with a bunch of water in it so um, this young man not only has built one house but he's now in the process of building a second house and he couldn't be happier so it's all these other little externalities that we don't think about of how you know of how people how this affects people's lives in the village um, also, you know, Apoki, there's a, a rice farmer named Apoki. We did a big bioswale on his land. He's har He harvested, and we walked across the land. It was still so wet after the harvest that some of our staff were like, why is he not planting again another season? So we actually talked about, let's, and Andrew and T uh, um, uh, Nuri team, if you're on here, what we talked about is, well, let's go and ask him to do a couple test trips, you know, along the swale further away and start to measure and see, well, can he get a second harvest? Because why not, you know? So it really, it just goes back to this, you know, just getting the function of the land back into so that it can be more um, useful and have this biological uplift. Um, Oh, hi, Rika. It is so inspiring. Our small team in, um, in P Bay remain committed to support your efforts and export uh, beyond this um, in Eagle. Yeah, thanks a lot, Rika. I mean, uh, I mean, and thanks to headquarters and DRC. I have to say, yeah. you know, when I even during my interview, my job interview, I said that my goal is to create a tectonic shift, not only in our agency, but in our industry, because I just knew that we can we can really address these issues. And and I see now many more people talking about regenerative practices, circular bioeconomy. But what I really love about working with DRC is this enabling environment where, you know, it wasn't just those, some crazy lady talking about some crazy ideas. Mm -hmm. So between DRC, you know, and our headquarters and the, and the regional leadership and having donors and country mm -hmm. leadership and, you know, just to all be working in partnership i think people feel you know this is this is a moving bus that we want to jump onto and this is the right way to go and so i think that we've got really the a team here um, on how to move things forward and create the model right and show how we can do this so i think we just got yeah yeah and just to mention something uh, she mentioned that we did uh, in feb we, we use a drone to do uh, this video uh, uh, and that was really a, a new also a way of working for drc using a drone in Uganda. And, uh, and uh, we did the same again this time. Uh, so we will be able to share with you definitely, of course, a presentation prepared by, by both of them. But as well, we will share with you the drone video done in Feb. And the, as soon as uh, the next one also is ready, take of course a little bit of time. We will share with you. Um, are you trying to share? It or? Yeah, she's trying to share yeah. that now. So just let's see if she can um, share. This maybe the one of Feb. It's short, right? And then yeah. we will have to wrap up because uh, yep, our time. friend Warren is <laughs> flying back to the <laughs> States. Yeah, thank you, Victor. Thanks, yeah. Victor. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just to, sorry also for starting so early this morning, but uh, because Warren Brush is flying back to States. Uh, it's Warren's fault. Yeah, it's my fault. So I'll take fault. it. I'll take fault. it. So I'm I'm putting two. Thanks a lot, Chris. It's in um, so I'm dropping this link. This is from our first video, yeah. and this was also done by um, P Bay Funding. That's a private innovation and business engagements. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, so the, uh, so yes. this was a partnership that, you know, we uh, that headquarters covered the cost of developing this video mm -hmm. so that we could share out what we're doing. And then uh, there's this other video, which is also, um, you know, our agency has invested in doing a pilot uh, in Burundi where we're restoring an entire hill. So um, so we will, it's on the chat, eh? so like that you can see the one we've done before, yeah. and then you will uh, receive also the presentation uh, and the next video as soon as ready uh, to share with all of you. Um, I think we are done now yeah. uh, because uh, we need to load the car of um, Warren yeah. <laughs> and then push him back to the airport. So I want to thank uh, everybody for joining. Uh, we we are happy to have so a uh, high level representation today. More it, we reach more than 25 persons at one stage. So sorry for the early morning and the the problem with the internet at some stage, but uh, yeah. we did it.
very uh, inspiring. I have read, I have read many, 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 yeah, many yeah, yeah, thank I you. have seen many people talking about inspiration, inspiring, mm. and this is what it is. And because we want to change things and we want to work differently. So thank you again, everybody. I wish you I had a nice uh, weekend and nice festive season. And uh, yeah. we see you soon. And we hope that we can bring back Warren Brush and Natalie Topa thank during you. the course of 2021 with COVID <laughs> or without COVID. Yes. <laughs> bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good day. Good day. Have a good weekend. Or is that up? It's almost weekend. Bye. Johnson. Johnson.